Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Wildlife Trust's Wild Live for December. First of all, I just want to say huge apologies for the technical difficulties we've had tonight. We know we're starting late as a result of it. We had real technical difficulties with uploading to the live stream on YouTube, and so we've had to switch over to a new stream. So apologies for that, and we know that's required many of you to uh, move across uh, to the link. So thank you for coming across to the new link. And we do apologise for the technical difficulties. At least it shows it's live, uh, as they always used to say in live television. Anyway, I'm delighted you're able to join us tonight for an incredibly timely discussion. And it is focused on where next for nature and British farming. We always knew this was going to be an important time to have this conversation right at the end of the Brexit transition period. And we know that farming, the future of farming in this country and the future of farming and the environment has been an absolutely central issue of debate around Brexit and particularly since the referendum in 2016. And we knew there was gonna be still big questions to answer this month, but we're delighted with this timing in the end coming just two days after the government published uh, their details of actually how the transition period for agriculture will work in this country and I'm delighted also that we have an absolute cracking panel to help us through these uh, issues tonight. We have uh, joined tonight, we have Minette Batters who will be known to many of you, President of the National Farmers Union. Delighted that Minette was able to join us tonight. Minette is of course herself a a farmer, a beef farmer in Wiltshire uh, and also a farmer that has uh, really been able to diversify across the farm. uh, Everything from a tithe barn that does wedding and corporate events I imagine not so much this year, Manette, but we shall see. We're here from you. Uh, but also a real passionate uh, defender of farmers, but someone that I think has done a great job in engaging way beyond the farming sector as well on these issues. We have Vicky Hurd, who's head of sustainable farming at the charity Sustain. And Vicky is someone that I've known for many years and has been quite a, a big player in the whole sustainability and farming and food debate over the years. And it's great to have Vicky joining us. She's uh, followed the uh, twists and turns around the Agricultural Act this year uh, superbly. And particularly, uh, I was doing a brilliant job of sort of live updates on the Agricultural Act um, on Twitter as it was going through Parliament, which I thought was fantastic. We also have Stephen Honeywood, who's a farmer at Halls Farm in Suffolk. And Stephen is part of the Jordan's Farm Partnership, which is a partnership between the Wildlife Trusts and Jordan's, the cereal manufacturers, the people that make granola and things like that. Uh, We've partnered with them at the Wildlife Trust and Jordan's for many, many years to help provide advice on how to do nature-friendly farming on Jordan's farms. And Stephen is one of those farms that benefits from that. And it'd be fantastic to hear from a farmer on the ground about how this is all going to work or not work. We shall see. Also delighted, we're joined by Janet Hughes, who's Director of Future Farming and Countryside at DEFRA. So absolutely right up there, helping make the decisions with ministers about future farming policy. And uh, absolutely, it's on top of all the detail of the policies and the latest thinking. We'll be able to explain that to us all. And finally, James Adler, our very own James Adler, who's Director of Biodiversity at the Surrey Wildlife Trust, but also an advisor to on land management across the Wildlife Trust network. And uh, delighted that James is able to join us. You know, I think agriculture, I've always thought this is such a fascinating discussion because in one sense, of course, we know uh, when you look at things like the State of Nature report that was published by a whole big coalition of NGOs towards the end of 2019, talking about the catastrophic declines in nature in this country over the last few decades. So 41% of our wildlife species having suffered big declines in their abundance in, since the early 1970s, uh, 50 uh, 50. Two percent of farmland birds having suffered big declines in abundance and actually that report saying agriculture was the lead driver of some of those declines. Uh, so there's always been a bit of a tension if you like between nature conservation and agriculture on the one hand. However it's a very different debate to many other issues isn't it? When we are taking on oil and gas companies or something like that you kind of think we it's sustainable to kind of phase those out, to phase out fossil fuels for example. But we all know Of course, no one wants to see agriculture phased out. We absolutely need sustainable farming for us all to survive. And so we're very interested in making sure for everyone there's a good future for farming and a sustainable future for farming. And we also know that farmers see the declines in nature as much as anyone. 
I would say our problem has never been farmers. Our problem has always been farming policy. And actually the problem for a lot of farmers has always been farming policy as well. So as we go through this big reset of farming policy at the moment, as we're heading towards the, at the end of the Brexit transition period, it's a really exciting time where farming groups and conservationists are able to come together and really talk about a future that can be set out that is good for farmers and good for nature. And that's really what we're trying to explore tonight. So we've had lots of promises from government over the last few years on this. We had uh, Michael Gove, when he was Secretary of State uh, for the Environment, promised that we would maintain and enhance our environment, environmental standards as we Brexit. And we've obviously had lots of promises that we're going to see a new dawn for agriculture and nature in this country. Uh, let's have a look at the video that DEFRA produced in 2018 to really highlight some of the promises, some of the intentions of what would be delivered through the new Agricultural Act and changes to farm policy. So those were the promises as set out by DEFRA in 2018 as to how agricultural reforms would deliver sunny lit uplands for everyone and very convincing and very exciting it was too. So let's now hear from Janet, from Janet Hughes, who, as I said, is right up there in DEFRA, really one of the top civil servants at the cutting edge of this whole kind of area. Janet, do you believe at DEFRA you've delivered that? You've had the Agricultural Act and just earlier this week you published uh, the document The Path to Sustainable Farming, an Agricultural Transition Plan 2021 to 2024. Does it deliver on those promises set out in 2018? Thanks, Craig, and thanks very much indeed for having me here and to everyone who's dialing in. I'm delighted to be here to answer your questions. Um, I think what we've published this week is us just getting started so I think we won't be able to say we've delivered until we've completed the transition successfully and achieved the two things that we're here to achieve. And those two things are both together a vibrant, thriving agriculture sector and better outcomes in terms of environment, animal welfare and climate change from that sector. And we think that we need to move beyond thinking of those two things as opposing things that, that, that need to be, you need to choose one or the other and instead be thinking about how can we achieve both of those at the same time. And so our programme is designed around how do we do that? And what we're going to be doing is we are going to be phasing out direct payments over the next seven years, starting from next year. And all of that money will be going back into the sector 
in order to achieve those outcomes that I've just outlined. We're going to be improving our existing agri-environment schemes. So as of next year, there'll be a simplified and improved countryside stewardship offer for people to take up who wish to get involved in getting paid for public goods. Um, and we'll be rolling out the new environmental land management scheme. And the first elements of that will roll out in 2022 for wide participation. We'll actually start a pilot next year. And we're also going to be supporting prosperity within the sector through grant support, through advice, through innovation, research and development, and through helping people to um, enter into the sector. And finally, we're going to be sorting out the way that we regulate and enforce um, rules to do with agriculture and the countryside to make sure that what we're doing is effective and also fair and proportionate. So what we've set out this week is really is what we want to do. And we've also said something about how we want to do that. And I do want to highlight that here, because one of the main principles that we're going to follow is co-design. And we really mean what we say when we say we want to co-design what we're doing here with people who need to use the things that we're making and the people who care about them. So I really encourage those who have dialed in here, do also dial into our co-design workshops and get involved. Um, Google, Google the DEFRA Future Farming blog. We've got a new blog now where we'll be producing updates twice a week on what we're doing in the programme and what we're learning and, and, and how people can get involved. And we really, really encourage people to do that because it's going to take all of us and all of the expertise and energy that there is in all of the sectors that are interested in this reform to make it work and we're going to need to work collectively to do that and we I am very happy to be held to account throughout the transition for the principles we've outlined about doing co-design building trust in what we're doing making things clear and simple making things fair and reasonable and focusing on outcomes and making sure that we really are always doing things to work towards those two outcomes that I mentioned. And the one other thing I don't want to say about the way we're going to manage this is that we are quite deliberately designing this rollout, not in the traditional policy way of outlining every single detail at the beginning and then sticking to it come what may, because if you look at the history of failure in government, that's how to fail. How to succeed is to take a test and learn approach where we learn as we go, we collaborate openly, we work openly with everybody who's interested in what we're doing and with farmers in particular who have to actually implement these changes on their land and we adapt and we adjust our course based on what we're learning. So I'm very keen for people to get involved here through this question and answer session. Also, I'm very active on Twitter, so feel free to ask me a question anytime you like there or email me and do follow our blog and get involved. Um, because, as I say, we're only going to succeed if we all work on this together. So to come back to your question, have we delivered? Well, not yet, no. But we've made a, we've made a down payment on delivery by making clear our plans and setting out the roadmap. And there will now follow a period of much more active communication and engagement from the programme. And I encourage everyone to get along, get involved. And then you can ask me in seven years time, did we deliver or not? And I'll only be happy at that point if we have, in fact, achieved those outcomes that I set out at the beginning. And I and my team are committed wholeheartedly to doing just that. Well, Janet, thank you very much for that great summary. And uh, thanks for being very clear and honest about that. I mean, I think everyone would uh, welcome the spirit of co-creation that you're talking about there. And I think people feel it at the moment in the sector, particularly after briefings you've given to organisations like us and others, that we feel that spirit of co-creation is there, understand the test and learn approach. But I mean, I've got to fire back up at you the issue about urgency, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> it's four and a half years since the referendum. So is, you know, you could just say what's yeah. been going on for four and a half years. And we're about to enter the UK, uh, the UN decade of restoration, ecological restoration. Uh, in your transition plan you published this week, it says there will also be some new standalone programs to support tree planting, peatland restoration and nature recovery. These will be mm -hmm. consolidated within our new environmental land management offer after 2024 well that's 40 percent of the way through the un mm -hmm. decade of ecological restoration you know can't we move faster what's what's going to happen until then this is an ecological crisis isn't it what, what are we can, can we not move faster well so craig you you won't be surprised to learn that you're not the only person who's been asking us that question um, and we do very much feel the sense of urgency, both with getting on with the reforms, but also making sure that everybody knows what is coming and making sure everybody's got all of the information they need. And that is a very real need, particularly for farmers. And it's their livelihoods we're talking about here. So we do take that. We take both of those types of urgency. 
really seriously in the programme. And when we talk about 2024, that's the point by which we want to be able to say we've got a consolidated live offer. We've tested it, we've scaled it, we've made it um, available to absolutely everybody. But that doesn't mean we're not doing anything between now and then at all. All of the money that we take out of direct payments will go back into the sector in that same year. And so in 2021, people will be able to access productivity support and prosperity support. People will be able to access the um, existing and improved countryside stewardship scheme. And we really encourage people to start doing that um, as, a, as a stepping stone to the future. And we see this as a gradual rollout starting in 2021 with that set of actions. And we encourage everyone to get involved from that point forward. And then from 2022, we'll be bringing on stream sustainable farming incentive, slurry investment support, animal health and welfare pathway, and, and more. Um, and we again encourage everybody to get involved in that and what we learn in those early years we will feed into because we'll be running this alongside piloting elements of the new environmental land management scheme that we haven't yet tested at scale or end to end in real life so that by the time we get to 2024 we've scaled up those things we've developed them along with the sector and we're at that stage scaling them and live so I wouldn't like anybody to think that we're sitting on our laurels or taking it easy between now and 2024 or indeed that there aren't things that people can be doing during that period, because there certainly are. And that money, as I say, is going back into the sector to be spent on these outcomes from day one. So essentially, you're saying the changes can begin immediately in early yes. 2021, uh, but you're saying it'll only be fully delivered by 2024, but it's not yeah. like waiting until then for the changes Correct. to start. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think that's really important from a delivery perspective because I, I'm a student of government failure because I'm a nerd. And, um, and lots, lots of government failure happens because we spend a long time designing something and then we release it all in one big bang and then we wonder why it doesn't work. And so scaling up gradually in this way is a much safer, more reliable, more trustworthy way to proceed so that we can correct our course as we go and scale up gradually rather than suddenly launching something. And we know that when we've done that in the past in DEFRA, it hasn't worked. And so we don't want to repeat those mistakes of the past. Um, but we, we have to we have to strike a balance because we want to be we want to do this in a safe and trusted way. But we absolutely feel the urgency, you're quite right to, to point it out, of getting on with this and making the changes. And when you talk about piloting the environmental land management schemes, uh, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of people will hear the word pilot and think you're talking about a handful of farms. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more than that, though, isn't it? It's yeah, a bit more so than a handful. It's more than a handful, but it's not huge numbers. So we're going to be doing two things. We're going to be starting the um, national pilot next year and we'll start with a thousand farmers and it will scale up to about 5,000 farmers. So you're not, you know, five, five ish percent of farms will be able to get involved in the pilot. Um, but that's not huge scale. That will enable us to test in detail in a kind of one to one way with lots of farmers. What, how does this work? How does that work? What's the right what's the right way to solve this problem? What's the right way to solve that problem? Um, but at the same time, we will be offering sustainable farming incentive at scale from 2022. Some in, initial um, elements of that and then we'll feed the pilot findings into that service and gradually improve and expand it over the following two years so there are and again i said um, i want to make sure i'm clear that we encourage people to get involved in countryside stewardship in that period of time as well and we are making improvements to that from january which we've laid out in the plan to encourage people to do that and to de-risk it for them as an option great all right well janet uh janet hughes director of future farming and countryside at defa thank you very much for that You're overview welcome. and uh, we'll be coming back to you in the q a of course and sure. uh you've got definitely got better bookshelves than i have i like those bookshelves anyway uh so now let's go for a slightly different perspective perhaps uh vicky hurd who's head of sustainable farming at uh sustain vicky as i said has followed the twists and turns of this whole debate over many years, but particularly the twists and turns this year around the Agricultural Act, the Agricultural Bill that then became Act. Vicky, do you think uh, the government has delivered on the promises they set out two years ago? Vicky, we can't hear you at the moment. Maybe, maybe try again. I thought that would happen automatically, sorry. Um, that's a good question, Craig. Yes, I have. And, and I have, I did start out in the 90s with the very first agri-environment scheme. So we've come a long way from there. And it is very good to hear what Janet says and the test testing that they're doing. Um, I think, I think we've making, we're making the first steps, but I don't think we've really acknowledged sufficiently that we need to do some really urgent changes. The climate and nature emergencies and the health crisis 
that we have that is related not only to what we're producing and eating here, but what we're taking from overseas, for instance, the disturbances in sort of rainforests through our use of feeds, things like that, that are actually potentially contributing to the spread of zoonoses. So we've really got to acknowledge that and show leadership, um, particularly next year when we're having a big climate um, conference in, in Glasgow. So I think with the Agriculture Act, we have and with the new wider support program that DEFRA have announced, we, it could be critical. It could be really, really good. And we're really hopeful with the right detail, with the right budget. And one, one of the concerns is that the budget that has been promised ends in 2024 or at the end of this parliament. So big question marks about whether there will be the adequate budget to support farmers after that. And the big other question about the um, program is about advice and whether there will be adequate advice and training for farmers to go through the transition to change what they're doing and the regulatory baseline um, that isn't available yet it's severely lacking um, there's some good ambition but it also the agriculture act does lack goals there were targets for instance pr pr um, proposed for um, reducing pesticide impact and for climate targets they were voted out so we desperately need those kind of targets and the regulatory approach in the environment act which i know you'll be watching carefully craig to reinstate strong binding targets and, and regulation one of the things that the act does do and we haven't spoken about yet is it puts in place a possibility of new statutory codes of practice for the supply chain this is vital so as far farmers get too little from the marketplace and get abusive practices from their buyers and that doesn't help them in changing to higher welfare better environmental and nature protection so the act does have good policies in it they're exciting but they're also risky as we know and and if we lose thousands of farmers over the next um, few years in the transition with brexit with the trade deals with the amalgamations and, and abandonment for instance we could lose many of the features and the matrix that nature needs and, and the, the landscape that we love. The features, the livelihoods and the local food systems that we need to really protect um, if we lose a lot of farmers. And I think that's a real risk. The other risk from the system is, is of going down the route of sustainable intensification. So we spare a bit of land for nature on the edges and in certain areas, but we intensify production with a bit of greening around the edges, but intensifying production on the farmland. Um, and we all need, we need farmers instead to go down an agroecological route, using nature and the um, natural systems to deliver good food and pest management and all, um, all the other things, the nutrients. This is both possible and feasible. We know farming can go down this route to provide us with the nature that we need both in farm, in field, and the edge of field. Um, this isn't about going backwards or anything like that, it's going about forwards in a wise way with systems that can provide us with the food we need. Not necessarily the food that the industry wants to sell us or that we want to waste because we currently waste 30% of food or to put in large scale energy generators. You know, the idea of using crops for energy um, yeah, it might be good small scale, small scale energy generation, but large scale use of our land for energy generation. It's big red signals for us. And I, I hope for the, if those concerned with wildlife, because that's not the best use of our land. And we need to be feeding ourselves and protecting nature on the land and in the field. So we need a movement to support those farms that are demonstrably protecting nature. And I say that particularly we need the market and the people to do that because we haven't got the protection for those farmers protecting nature and, and tackling climate change. We haven't got protection for them from the trade deals that we're gonna have as we leave Europe. MPs voted against protections for those standards in law. So cheaper products could flood in as we do in deals with America, with Australia. We know that, we know the different regulations and the lower regulations in many countries. And so all we've got now is scrutiny by parliament and that is not enough. So we need consumers to have ways of supporting farmers doing things well. So they need to buy from farmers and bypass the current centralized, highly um, complex supply chains. So what we're doing at Sustain is trying to build up the alternatives routes to market for those farmers. And we need people like the viewers today to support those farmers. Um, and we need people to get political as well, but loads of things need to happen. It's, it's a very complex picture, but the Agriculture Act and the, and the program that Jeanette 
described is a valuable step. Great. Well, Vicky, thank you very much. Well, of course, farmers could not be more central to this debate and delighted that we've got Manette Batters of the NFU joining us tonight. Uh, let's first of all, to segue into uh, Manette's presentation, uh, let's see the video from the NFU on uh, future of British farming. Locations like this, as well as producing food, we can also produce a beautiful landscape which is enjoyed by millions of people throughout the country uh, on a regular basis. And if farmers weren't there, then I don't know what workforce you would put in place to be able to provide this facility. Since we planted the woodland, we've seen uh, an increase in the number of birds from something like 45 species to 60 species. So it's really enhanced the wildlife on the farm. There is no one in this country better placed than farmers to deliver high quality environment. So then, the big question for you, Minette, uh, Agricultural Act, now, now law, the transition plan published this week, wherever we may or may not be with a trade deal with the EU, where does it leave us? Where does it leave British farming and where does it leave British farming and nature? Minette. Craig, thank you. And thank you so much uh, to the Wildlife Trust for the invite to be here with you tonight. Um, and a very good evening to everyone. Um, it, it seems like a different world, Craig, that you and I were on the Oxford Farming Conference platform with the then Secretary of State, Theresa Villiers. It was only back in January of this year, yeah. but my goodness, had we known in January what was gonna happen and where we'd be right now, we would quite literally have never believed it. Um, what a journey, what a, a time, you know, agricultural bills don't come along every day of the week. The last agricultural act was 1947. And the point that Craig made right at the very beginning about farmers follow the policy. Effectively, governments make the policy, farmers follow the policy, we buy the food, which makes it probably the most political choice that we ever make. And do we ever relate the two together? Probably not. Um, but this is a, a momentous time, an incredibly important time. I, I thought it was extraordinary and a real flashback to the past that the Agricultural Bill achieved royal assent on Remembrance Day. Now, bearing in mind the 1947 Act had learnt the lessons of two world wars, 30% uh, self-sufficiency and the huge challenges of being able to feed a country. And the fact that the Royal Ascent was achieved on that day, Remembrance Day, I, I just think is a sort of fairly defining moment. And I guess not to forget the lessons that history teaches us while we're on this journey. And what is gonna shape the future more of food, sustainability, biodiversity, environmental delivery, ultimately, bizarrely in many ways, is the outcome of the trading relationship with the European Union. Um, there was, of course, a deadline put in place. We've got very used to them on the 15th of October. That deadline has been and gone. We thought we would hear at the weekend. We thought we would hear on Monday. We're now told we might hear on Friday, but be under no illusions as to how important this deal is. And it's very easy in the whirlwind of dialogue that is going on at the moment to think, well, actually, we've left the EU. It doesn't matter uh, that much will have new trade deals and indeed we will but that one is and always has been and always will be the most important one because it is 500 million people on our doorstep 30 miles away 90 percent of our exports go into the EU market and 40 percent of our imports now that can all change but that will remain our closest trading partner and getting this wrong, a no deal scenario is, as I'm sure everybody on this webinar knows, disastrous. It's catastrophic for agriculture. We'd be priced out of the EU market 
by taxes, by tariffs, we'd be forced into a place of putting in a reciprocal tariff. And of course, George Eustace commits very strongly to this. Does everybody around the cabinet table, will the country be able to afford to commit to it? Cheap food has ruled the day and in a time of austerity, a government will be focusing most of all on affordable food for this country. Now, one of my proudest moments, I think, now and, and looking into the future will always be the coalition that came together uh, to make the case on food standards. We wrote a letter of which um, the Wildlife Trust was a co-signatory, along with, I think, every single NGO out there. When I handed the letter over to the Prime Minister when I met him, I said, look, even the Mammals Association are on there. And he did look at it and he said, wow, this is some list of people. Um, obviously, sustain um, consumer organisations, which, um, as I say, every NGO, the vets, animal welfare experts, latterly, all the chefs, Jamie Oliver, Jimmy Doherty, Raymond Blanc, Prue Leith, Delia Smith. It's a coalition that has never, ever come together before. And it really, I think, struck a chord with the country. We had a million people in under a month sign a food standards petition. Um, that was, I think, a real marker, a real line in the sand for government as to what the people of this country expected to see out of trade deals. I know Craig is going to pick this up and questions with me, but the challenge in all of this has always been working with the majority government. And my focus has always been we have to get something over the line. It might not be perfect. The world isn't perfect. And certainly the current situation isn't perfect. What was it we were going to get over the line? Ultimately, that was primary legislation on the face of the trade bill, meaning that the Trade Agricultural Commission is embedded in primary legislation, will be reviewed every three years. And the critical point, the critical juncture was getting the reporting process in the agricultural bill so that Parliament, our MPs, we can all barrack from the outside, remember, but it is our MPs, our democracy that ultimately will drive the day. So it has empowered them to be able to scrutinize trade deals before they are ratified. I made the point last week uh, on a World Farmers Organization webinar that I really believe this is the time of farmers. I really believe the next decade will be the decade of farmers because we cannot deliver for the environment. We cannot deliver for biodiversity. We cannot get back to sustainability to focusing on our soils unless we do it with our farmers and that doesn't just apply here that applies across the world but it does mean at the cop next year our government has a global opportunity to look at how we sustainably produce food both here and send that message across the world we set out janet very well set out a seven-year transition this is the opportunity of our time but only if we make it craig thank you Thank you very much. I, okay, well, look, I, uh, you, you've done the thing about standards, so I won't uh, probe you there, actually, because I think you've done that very well. Um, what I do want to pick up, actually, is a, a really important point that you said in your on Monday in your response to the transition plan. You said that actually what was really lacking was the detail that farmers need uh, over this transition period. Um, can you just explain to us why is that so important? Why is it farmers need detail? You know, why is it that a lot of people perhaps won't understand why farmers will need a sort of long-term planning? There, there are, I sort of pick out three points in, in all of that, Craig. One, one is the detail, you know, so we shouldn't underestimate that this is seismic change. We also shouldn't underestimate farm business income figures, because it's very clear for lowland and upland livestock that departure from direct support sees a drop of 60 to 80 percent in farm business income. Now, that, that is seismic and that will be very, very difficult to manage for some without the detail of what the new sustainable farming initiative is going to bring back into their businesses. So, so detail is everything, but I think the point that Janet makes and what I have tried to do, bringing 10 farming organisations together, working with you, RSPB, WWF and others, is when we are making the case at the next election, which is only four years time, we have to be a united industry with a policy that works, with a policy that is deliverable, that ultimately the next government will say, well, look, everybody is united. This is working. We've clearly got to be continuing our investment in it and potentially investing more because I would argue, and I'm sure you'd agree, what is more important than the food that we eat and the countryside and the environment that we look after. 
So detail is key. The points that Vicky made on the supply chain, the functionality of it, absolutely essential. We had the third most affordable food in the world, the most affordable in the EU. And that is because we have a very, very complex retail environment. We're living with the most savage retail price war ever at the moment. You've seen online shopping go from 7% in March to 14% now. Now that's a cost, that is a massive cost. Tesco is predominantly picking up a huge proportion of that cost. It is unsustainable. We're talking about sustainability. Food prices at the moment, unsustainable as we are at the moment. Because of course, then you've got the discounters they're the discounters. They've got to discount off of what the big guys do. So this is this is big picture politics. And my last conversation ever with Michael Gove on this subject, I said to him, fairness and functionality and transparency in the supply chain. Who does it? Is it DEFRA? Is it Bayes? And he, I think, probably had the truest answer to date. He said, no, it would need to be Treasury. And I think that speaks volumes. But ultimately, Treasury's focus is affordable food, understandably. We wanna make it affordable for everybody. I think it's incredibly important in these times. The third point, Craig, just to pick up very quickly is don't forget four nations, one country. We've got to agree framework, otherwise we will distort uh, our own internal market. We cannot afford for that to happen. Yeah, and it's uh, we need to pick up on the fact that actually the the uh, transition plan published this week was for England, of course. Absolutely. Um, and uh, there will be different arrangements in the devolved nations. So, and you know, we're, uh, if we think this is kind of running late for England, there's it's even you know more behind, more delays in other parts of the UK in many respects, and bigger, even bigger question marks. So, uh, Manette, thank you very much. That's given us a fantastic overview of uh, where things are at for the National Farmers Union. And obviously, it's been a very difficult time, I think, of uncertainty for farmers. And, I, you know, we all hope that this is providing a little bit more clarity now, much as inevitably uh, you'd be wanting more detail as soon as possible. Um, so our next speaker is James Adler who's Director of Biodiversity with the Surrey Wildlife Trust and a land management advisor right across the Wildlife Trust. You may not know it, but actually across the Wildlife Federation, we have 26 working farms of our own, which we run to really try and demonstrate uh, approaches to nature-friendly farming. And in fact, we give advice to 5,000 farmers and land managers every single year. So we're really engaged with farmers on that. And the kind of advice we get from James and from others across the Wildlife Trust Network is absolutely essential in delivering that. So James, you've had your head buried in these documents this week on the transition plan. You followed this debate very closely, but also you really know how it works on the ground for you, through your uh, experience in Surrey and elsewhere. Tell us, you know, what's what's our thinking now as, as Wildlife Trust? What do we what do you hope to see uh, agricultural policy? Which direction it will take now that the act has been passed? Now this transition plan is being published. Uh, which direction now would you like to see? I think. What I'll say to start with is let's talk about the absolute positive, that the farming organisations, politicians, environmental organisations have come together and enshrined in the Agriculture Act is public money for public good. We should not underestimate how world leading that is as a statement, that public money is going to go in and let's define what public goods are. That means public money paying for farmers to put the right systems in place to give us clean water, clean air, an increase in biodiversity, an increase in the amount of plants, all of the good things that farmland can give wider society. And those things are very, very hard for farmers to market. And it's absolutely right that public money should go into those at good levels so that the marketplace comes out of that and public money goes into it. But what we're lacking, and it's already been said by all the other speakers, is the detail for that. And money is being taken out of farming right now. And what we've got is a series of pilots which are going to guide us for what's going to happen in four years time with possibly an entirely different government in place. And it's this challenge, it's how do we influence those pilots and create that sense of urgency right now when we are already in the midst of the climate and ecological crisis. And it's that urgency which unfortunately when like the uh, farming and wildlife geek that I am that I opened the early Christmas present from the government of the agricultural transition plan that I felt, so, I felt a, a sense of disappointment. Um, another commentator has said it probably better than I can in that it felt like an announcement about a series of announcements. Mm -hmm. And yet we have that real sense of urgency. I know that Steve will be struggling to plan his farming system for the next four years. I know that I'm struggling to plan my farming system for the next four years. 
And I'm also struggling to plan how I'm going to manage the absolute jewels in the crown of the protected site network. So I'm talking about the sites of special scientific interest, which also get funding from these different schemes. You know, how are we going to manage those sites? How are we going to make sure that we can survive the transition and work with these pilots to get the right results for nature on those sites as well? Great, James, thank you very much. Um, we've had uh, a, a comment in, a question from uh, a certain Jake Fines has come in. I don't know if any of you have heard of Jake. Uh, up at the Hokum Estate, he said it's fundamentally important we work with each other, uh, farmers and those of us trying to make sure we put nature in recovery. Uh, is this the ambition of the Wildlife Trusts? Jake, I hope you've heard very clearly tonight, it is absolutely the ambition of the Wildlife Trusts. And I think James really personifies that as someone that works in the Wildlife Trust, but works with farmers day after day after day. In fact, has land management himself. Um, but actually, we also have many other initiatives, not least the, the partnership we've had with Jordans over many years that we've developed there. And as we go into our next speaker, let's have a little, little look at that video, at a video about the partnership between the Wildlife Trusts and Jordans. Farming is changing. Farmers across the country are taking part in a new scheme to turn 10% of their land into wildlife habitats, thanks to the Jordans Farm Partnership. The Jordans Farm Partnership is a unique collaboration between Jordan Cereals, the Wildlife Trusts, LEAF, and the Prince's Countryside Fund. The idea is to create wildlife corridors that attract insects and birds and help protect the countryside. Sustainable farming is absolutely critical for the future of the world's food supply. We have to be efficient in the way that we use scarce resources. And that means precision farming. The technology our farmers use is cutting edge. It helps them follow the most modern sustainable farming methods. We're always trying to improve our efficiency and technology is one of the ways we're doing it. It means that we can be really efficient with where we put our inputs. It means we don't use any more fuel than we need to and it means we can look after the soil to the best we can. Supporting wildlife and looking after the countryside is key to our farmers. We're providing habitat for all sorts of wildlife, birds, bees and mammals as well. But they also care about connecting with the community. We like to re-engage people with seeing where their food comes from. And of course, making great food. The countryside means everything to me. To me, that not only means growing the crops, but it means to enhance the environment that we live in for future generations. The 42 farmers across the country who grow oats for Jordans are part of the scheme. All our farms involved in the Jordans Farm Partnership will become LeafMark accredited, meaning they are improving the environment through elements such as conserving energy, leaving habitats for wildlife and reducing waste. Sometimes when we get out of bed and go up onto the farm and we see the wildlife and we see the crops growing, it's enough to make the heart sing. So I'm delighted that tonight we're joined by Stephen Honeywood, who's one of the farmers in the Jordan's Farm Partnership between Jordan's and the Wildlife Trust. And Stephen, you know, please enlighten us. Uh, what's your perspective? Or give us a farmer's perspective on nature friendly farming and and tell us why farming with nature in mind is important to you. Stephen. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK, so um, thank you. And thank you to everybody um, who's dialed in tonight. Um, for us, I guess, well, personally for myself, um, I'm a seventh generation farmer and I've always valued what we have here and taken myself as a custodian of the block of land that we're fortunate enough to farm. And, and to me, part of that is to be able to pass it on to the next generation and in a better, more environmentally sustainable way than I was fortunate enough to take it on. Now, when I took it on, it was uh, very much uh, preserved by the future generations by the past generations, um, but obviously with the pressures of um, of the supply and more of a concentrate on concentration on food, um, biodiversity had maybe taken a sideline. And perhaps twenty years ago, uh, biodiversity it wasn't a buzzword in the farming sector. It wasn't something that people thought about. Um, and as time has moved on, uh, now where we are today it is absolutely key and vital that we do something about that. So 
our journey started um, 16 years ago, I guess, when, when I probably decided that um, firing right to the bottom of the hedge and cutting every hedge to the, within an inch of its life and up to every watercourse wasn't probably the best thing we should be doing. And over this period of time, more recently, um, with the Jordan's Farm Partnership, we've enhanced our farm so that we can, we actually now fine tune, thanks to the advice that we received from the Wildlife Trust, um, our environment and management plan. And, and that's something that we have now that we look at and constantly monitor and, and evolve uh, and we're fine tuning. And, and we really can see the benefits of that. But, but I think key to this is that we have a business that is uh, sustainable. We have uh, high environmental standards. We have huge numbers of birds, wildlife. We've, we have red species, we have red list species, but it's come down to actually fine tuning what we do. And it's not just a case of leaving a patch of wild bird mix or planting a pollen and nectar mix. It's actually managing all the hedgerows, the networks and an understanding and, and, it, and it's thanks to the support from people like, like Jordan's and, and, and the Wildlife Trust that we can do this. But obviously this comes at a price with, um, you know, with where we are and sitting and, and the difficulties that, we, difficulties that we all as farmers now face. Um, and I think as Manette quite rightly said earlier, we've, we're now in a position where, um, you know, we, we have got a nice, a fantastic sustainable farm, but obviously we're very concerned um, with what's going to happen in the future and, and actually how it would evolve. Yes, it sounds really great. And, and I really am excited that we've got the opportunity to make this massive change. Um, but I think we've also got to be mindful of the fact that, um, you know, we, we do need to, we do need to be able to provide food. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that you know, I know that what we have provides a nice balance between uh, providing a, a good sustainable environment where we have, uh, we've restored meadows, uh, lots of things we've done. And, but actually at the same time, we can actually produce and have a viable agriculture, an arable farm. Great, Steve, thank you. And what would you say for you, particularly then in, in your part of the world in Suffolk, what would you say are the, are the challenges that perhaps are local to you there that might be different in other parts of the country, would you say? Um, so I think, um, the, the, I guess the, the challenges, um, if, for example, for us, we are a particularly heavy land farm. Um, for those of you listening, um, the difference between heavy land and light land um, to the consumer. Uh, heavy land is predominantly clay-based soils and light land is predominantly sandy-based soils. Um, one of the things that we've struggled with um, is to generate our pollen and nectar mixes because typically flowers, wildflowers like poorer soils, so sandy soils. But actually what we've developed is our mixes and pollen mixes that have worked um, on our farm. Now this has taken us probably five or six years to actually really fine tune what we have um, but we've got something that works so every farm faces its challenges and um, I think it's just it's important for for people to understand that you need to perhaps and this is a message perhaps for, for Janet and and the, the approach that DEFRA are taking that you can't blanket every farm with the same brush and 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 we do need to pay specific detail and even within our group, the farm group that we have here in the um, Blackbourne Valley, which incorporates Suffolk Wildlife Trust, you know, there are variations even within half a mile of neighbouring farms. And I think, you know, that's the real key thing um, that needs to come back to DEFRA on this is, is understanding that it cannot be a blanket policy and a blanket um, prescription for all farms. Uh, and I think, um, just going back to what Jeanette, Jeanette said earlier about co-designing things, I think that's, some, that's something that we've actually managed to do very well with the Wildlife Trust, their knowledge is to co-design our plan, work out what between us, what actually works best um, for the wildlife in our area, and actually from that be able to enhance what is relevant to our area rather than something that isn't um, and trying to achieve the impossible. Great, Stephen, thank you very much uh, for that. I think it's very important to hear that uh, experience from on the ground. And we are delighted to be working with you through the Jordan's Farm Partnership. 
Great, thank you. Okay, well, we've got loads of questions coming in. If you want to ask questions to the panel, please ask them through the chat function on YouTube. And my colleagues behind the scenes uh, try and get as many to me as possible. We will get through as many as we can. We can never get through all of them because they are flooding in tonight. I'm going to do three really quickly, please. Just for you, Janet, you'll be delighted to know. Uh, you can just give a really quick one sentence answer. And if, okay. if the answer if the answers don't know, that's absolutely fine. But I might as well fire them at you. Okay. Uh, one from Richard Black. Uh, Janet, will there be any change in the application window for countryside stewardship? At the moment, it is very restrictive. Uh, we are looking at that. Yes. Great. Thank we're looking you. at can we have a more flexible window? That's the thing we're looking at. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, one from Tammy Smalley. Um, Janet, how do you decide where the national pilot is as the farming sector in the Fens is very different to that of the uplands of the Pennines, for instance? We're going to be looking for, I'm trying to do this in a rapid fire way, we're going to be looking for participants that represent a range of different types of farms exactly for that reason. And exactly going back to the point Steve just said, because we know we can't have a blanket policy that applies to all farms or extrapolate from one type of farm to others. So we will be looking for a wide range of participants in the pilot to help us do that. Great, thank you. And finally, one from uh, Christopher, uh, with reference to the environmental land management schemes. Mm -hmm. Will wildlife conservation projects that are already in place be eligible for ELM support, particularly recent woodland planting? Yes, we are working on how do we make it. So there's two elements to this. One, if you're in a scheme from 2024, providing you with a smooth route to come out of that scheme and into environmental land management. And second, there's a second aspect to that, which is if you've already made some improvements and changes, are you somehow disadvantaged? And absolutely, we don't want that to happen. And we want, we're designing environmental land management so that we reward maintenance of assets that people have already put in place, as well as investment in new ones. Great. Thank you very much. OK, so I'm going to go out to the panel for a bit of a conversation about no big surprise uh, one of the themes of the, the night so from Ruth and this actually came in before we even started it was pre-submitted uh, Ruth says as a dairy farmer and an employee of Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust so I had to pick her really didn't I when it was a combination of those I'm passionate about high animal welfare and environmental standards both are co core values to our small family farm achieving both ultimately increases the cost of production how do you encourage the public to accept these costs? And we've had a number of questions, uh, you know, huge number of questions along the lines of, of that, you know, actually just the issues about cheap food. How are we going to do this if everyone's just going to be focused on cheap food? Uh, a question from Roger James. Will farmers get better prices in the distorted supermarket dominated supply chain? Uh, loads of questions along the theme of just cost of food. And, and is there such a thing as cheap food? And so on. How do we pay for these these the better uh, production standards? Who wants to kick us off? I'm happy. Go on, Vicky. Can I? Yeah, it's a, a big, very, very good um, question. We think food should be affordable, um, not cheap, and it should reflect the true cost of production. That's easy for me to say. How do we internalize, as you say, reflect all the costs of production in in the end price of food? We need to do that and DEFRA needs to drive that in, in how it regulates, in how it incentivizes, and how it um, penalizes the wrong kind of production. But the marketplace also must pay and the marketplace needs to change. That's why I mentioned how we need to have new routes to market because we think a huge amount of the pound that people pay, they pay very little, as Minette said, it's the cheapest food. Eight, farmers get 8% of what we pay in the shop. So 8p out of every pound, on average is, is, is where what the farmers get. So that means, you know, 94% goes somewhere else. And obviously there's costs of, of manufacturing, transport and all that kind of thing, but it's a ridiculous situation. Those making the most risky decisions and dealing with the climate get the littlest. So we've got to change that dynamic and get more of the food pound to the farmer. And I, I think we can do that. We could do that with regulation. I don't know if this government or future governments will do that. So we need to also build alternatives so the sort shorter supply chains so consumers can support the farmers directly and and more of the money goes directly to the farmers um, in a, a, a fairly trading a better trading platform that i think all these things that need to happen and, and regulation of the supply chain uh, unfair trading practices has to come in as soon as possible for all sectors at the moment all they're doing is dairy and that's not enough my next uh, 
alongside um, bringing the 10 farming organisations together to look at what a sustainable food and farming scheme could, could look like to support the work that, that Janet is, is leading on and, and on the co-design principle, we've also worked up um, a proposal, basically with three pillars on functionality, transparency, uh, and fairness in the supply chain. And it's fair to say, Craig, it is very different sector by sector. So at the moment, you've got the dairy contracts um, work that is currently going through um, legislation at the moment, but you've got to look at this in the round and you've got to look at every sector. And ultimately, all these things cost money. I mean, even if we take our poultry sector, 16% of those costs are EU rules and regs. Now, there's a genuine desire to take things up a bit more, but at the moment, you know, those costs, when we're being undermined by cheaper raw ingredients that don't have to meet those standards, and this has been the big point of discussion, really, with US, UK, it's not about the chlorination of chicken, it's about the values that underpin food production, the things that we have demanded, you know, light, vet med, stocking densities, all of which mean that you have lower antibiotic usage, tick for, for animals and for humans, and also you... Um, you're doing the, the right thing um, for human health as well. So I think public money is for public goods, you know, has a big role to play in paying for what the market won't, because what we've got to be really careful that we avoid is a two tier food system, whereby we effectively say people on lower incomes where you can have cheap imported food, we don't mind how it's produced. And, you know, people here, the metropolitan elite, where you can have high quality British food, that would be disastrous for everybody. So. We do need to look at a comprehensive approach of fairness, functionality, and watching what we are importing wherever possible, making sure it is produced to the same standards. I do think, very quickly, Craig, China entering the race for net zero, President Biden coming in, climate change back on the agenda in the US. There is, on the back of COVID, a real global chance that people will actually think we've got to start aiming higher. There are many farmers in the US now who I'm speaking to who really believe that you know, this is their time. We've got to start aiming up. We've got to be focusing on sustainable food production, but it really needs political partnership working. Great, thank you. James, Steve, both of you engaged in nature-friendly farming. Uh, do you feel that downward pressure on, on prices or, or perhaps are you producing in, in kind of like a higher end market where you can charge the premium? Um, I mean, Minette's actually hit the, hit the nail right on the head. I mean, the nature of the way that we produce our livestock on um, low quality land and farm with the environment in mind means that we have to engage with those those high value markets that Manette is talking about. You know, we don't sell into the supermarkets. We sell direct through specialist butchers into, into London, uh, which commands the better value. Um, and it, it means that we do. We, you know, we can only engage with certain parts of the market. And I think it's really interesting, you know, the, the figure that Manette put out there with you know, one million people signing a petition about food standards. You know, we have many more than a million people in this country. So how do we engage with everyone who didn't sign that petition? How do we get them to understand that whether it's a school meal, whether it's a hospital meal, whether it's something in a discounted supermarket, these things have an impact on their quality of life beyond just the price that they're paying at that point of entry. So there's, there's something here that runs across all of government and across every single department and in education with every single element of our lives. It's a huge challenge. Mm. Just, just to add, just to add to that, Craig, I think um, it, it doesn't. It's obviously hugely important to the farmers to have a market, but obviously, what what inherently sits behind um, the farmers is a high quality manufacturing and uh, uh, industry as well, and a food supply chain. And once we start to lose that, then we will just start to open the floodgates to all this cheap imports now and i think that's really important that we have to we have to really start to support the british agriculture the high standards that we're working to um and it's going to be hugely challenging especially given covid uh, and the pressures that people's finances are going to be put on but you know and that really perhaps should be where some of the money should be heading um i think it's going to be very challenging but uh, you know if, if we take um, I think if you look at the, the the situation with with just for say to take the meat coming in, and that could have a devastating impact on um, upland farmers, sheep farming. Um, you know, so I think it's going to be a real challenge across all across all government departments to make sure that this is delivered. 
Janet, do you have comments on this? I mean, I, I, I recognise, I mean, you are a civil servant, not a politician, and a lot of this is very political. And uh, so we respect and understand, you know, the challenges you might have in, in saying some things on this. But I mean, in the in the transition plan, in the policies that have been produced already, is there anything that points to what can be done in this area? Yeah, so you're quite right to point out I'm a civil servant and I have to be a, impartial, um, so I won't get involved in the political debate. The other thing I would say is that I do have a big job, but it doesn't cover absolutely everything. And so there are some, there's some aspects of this, there's quite a few aspects of this that are not in my remit and I wouldn't like to make things up about them. In particular, supply chain fairness, where there has been a um, consultation about that, which closed in September and where the results are being analysed now about what can we do in particular in relation to the dairy supply chain, which Manette mentioned. Um, and then I think coming on to the kind of public goods aspect of this, there is in the agriculture transition plan, a section about animal health and welfare. And we are seeing animal welfare as part of the public goods that we want to pay for, where they're not recognized in the market, um, that those standards are not recognized in the market. And so the animal health and welfare pathway will help support farmers to put in place welfare measures, which will improve animal welfare and those, and those standards and also help reduce costs and, and increase productivity on those farms. And so there are definitely elements of what we're doing that will play into this debate. But I think it's, I wouldn't like to suggest that just because that's my answer to the question, I think it's a full answer to the question, because of course, there are many, as, as the other panelists have pointed out, there are many, many wider issues at stake here. And indeed, both, both in terms of different policy issues and also political ones. Great, Janet, thank you very much. And I do want to say we are delighted that you could join us tonight. It's um, in For the conversation we wanted to have tonight, it's really useful to have a senior civil servant that can talk through the detail. We really appreciate that. So I well, won't I'm always happy. I won't expect to, to say to give political answers on, um, on that. So thank you very much for that. Right, I'm going to turn to a, a, another nexus of issues now, which you'll all be very familiar with. Um, and I, I really want to sort of get a, see if we can uh, understand what the future might hold here. We had um, we had a particular question came in from a certain Papa Smurf. I, I always thought, well, let's not let's not use that if they're not prepared to give their name. But actually, then I look at it; it's a really good question. So, Upland Mid, Mid Wales is small scale sheep and beef. How are they going to profit and maintain the localism of meat production with the loss of small abattoirs? Uh, Jane Bassett said, "Do you see a future for livestock farming in the uplands? And if so, what is it?" Amara James asked, do plans for British farming include incentives to shift from animal agriculture, which uses a lot of land, especially in high welfare extensive systems, to growing co crops for human consumption? Now, all of these for me kind of point to a big debate that, that has been bubbling around for the last few years, of course, which I would summarise as sort of saying, some people saying we, we need to dramatically reduce our meat consumption. Sometimes that's kind of people, people react and say, are you saying we're going 100% vegan? And I don't hear too many people saying that, but a lot of people, not least the Committee on Climate Change, suggest that we need to cut our meat consumption roughly by about 20% by 2050 uh, to achieve net zero. Uh, eating, uh, eating Better Coalition suggests, I think, a 50% cut in meat consumption by 2030. Uh, George Monbiot famously, uh, sorry to mention that name for some of you, um, I know we'll react to that, but George Monbiot talking about how we can have massive rewilding in the uplands and it's all very uneconomic there apparently anyway. Um, let's see where we can get to on this. I mean, uh, oh, and the other thing to say is in the transition plan published by the government this uh, week, there is also the provision in there to help uh, some farmers retire from the sector where it's not economically feasible for them to do so. So what I'm trying to understand is what might this look like here? And what would be great is you know, to have a discussion, we all know on the panel, this isn't about people saying let's go 100% vegan or let's all eat even more meat. Where might we be heading long-term in this? And actually, what does it mean for farming in the uplands? Uh, do we still want farming in the uplands? How do we support that if it's uneconomic? How do we make sure it's a, a, a good lifestyle and provides a good return for farmers if they do? But how is it also good for nature? What does that mean for shifts to diets? Does it mean that we can make more space for nature and particularly space for large scale rewilding alongside uh, good healthy farming systems on top of that as well? Uh, how can we move forward across that whole range of issues? Big complicated area, but let's see if we can make a bit of sense of it because I think all those questions are pointing to that in one form or another. Um, who's going to kick us off on this? I'm going to look at look at the faces. Who wants to? Uh, Minette looks. Minette does look keen. Uh, <laughs> Minette, you are a beef farmer, of course. Oh yes, and kick us like, off. There's so much in there. 
Um, look, huge, huge frustration in, in sort of meat versus plant. I mean, the best crop that we grow in this country, and um, we're one of the few countries that has the climate to grow it, is grass. And one of the best things for our soils is grass. And one of the best things for our rotations is grass. And one of the best things for taking out chemical and synthetic fertilizer is ruminants. So basically you need, you need lots of poo and lots of poo means less synthetic fertilizer, means better and healthier soils. So what I'm saying is you need both. Um, and we should be really, really thankful of the climate that we have that we can produce the, the livestock here that again, don't link consumption with production because actually from a farming point of view, what we're not consuming here we should be exporting as a high value product to other parts of the world that don't have the luxury of the climate that we have here. Um, so we need to stop that debate because we need our livestock because it's good for our soils, it's good for our rotations, it's, it's really fantastic for soil health and fundamental to taking out the synthetic uh, fertilizers that we use as well. Um, so Craig, give me a pointer to what other bit you want me to pick up and then I'll, I'll move on. Well, do you think, I mean, do you, what do you think the future is, for, particularly for upland farming? I mean, we know it's challenging economically, um, you know, romantic, uh, you know, lovely romantics of images of it, television programmes, reality television programmes about it that are very, very popular, yeah. books about it very popular. We do have a romance for it, but it's, uh, it's uneconomic, isn't it? I'll say provocatively. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I don't think it is, and I don't think we can afford it to be uneconomic. And and I I get really upset on behalf of the people that I represent that we have these sort of conversations as if these people are sort of commodities and and they don't matter. And like the point I keep trying to make is, you know, down every farm track, these are beating hearts, these are families, these are people that have been there for generations, have been there for millennia, that have shape the very fabric of our countryside so we, we cannot lose them we just cannot lose them you know we we must not marginalize our upland farmers we must not marginalize our lowland farmers that's not saying they mustn't get with the game and and start to want to look at doing things differently which many are already i mean many people we tend to focus on the lowest common denominator of what isn't working but actually let's focus on what is working we've got some brilliant upland farmers we've got some brilliant lowland farmers we've got huge diversity of what we produce here so the uplands as far as i'm concerned will continue to have a thriving future um, there's enormous opportunities around what I would call the green gym. You know, we pay money to go and sit behind bricks and mortar and pump iron. Um, what on earth is going to be better for you than getting out, walking up hills, bringing in that countryside air, getting out, seeing the view? I've met so many people on my farm who I've talked to who, Craig, have said, oh, it's just so brilliant to be out. I was really, really struggling being inside and coming out, seeing your cows, walking through the countryside. I go home and I feel so much better. Well, let's embrace that and let's use it and let's value it and let's invest in it. You know, we are Do you think it still is a future? But so if you still have a, those upland farmers and they've got a, a healthy economic return, is that still them a healthy economic return from sheep farming or is it doing something else with their land? It's, it's going to be horses for courses. And, and sheep in this country ultimately will be primarily dictated by our relationship with the EU, at least in the short term, because 30 percent of what we produce goes into that EU market. So. Farmers, you know, farmers, these are businesses. Farmers respond to market signals. If there's a market, they'll produce for it. And to the lady that said she'll be producing more plant-based, well, again, I'll get back to the grass. You know, this country is, is a fantastic country for growing grass in. And in the uplands, you wouldn't want to be, you could be doing anything else. And you can't mow the uplands. You can't top or lawn mow the uplands. So you've got to have the grazing action, which Craig and the Wildlife Trust know better than anywhere else. You want the tearing action of your herds and flocks to create the great grass hoard for the biodiversity and the wildlife and nature to thrive. So I think we can do it, Craig. We are gonna do it differently, but let's not talk about it being uneconomically viable. Let's not talk about taking all our beef and sheep off the uplands as George Monbiot says, and having a wild abyss, I would call it. Let's just do it and embrace doing it differently, but make sure my duty is to make sure every farmer crosses the Brexit line. Do you see some areas for what wider rewilding? Do you, can you imagine that in some areas? Or? I, I think, again, it's a misnomer. I think every farm has wild areas on it. My farm has wild areas on it, and I'm delighted to make more of those wild areas. But, 
you know, why does it have to be an either or? Why can we not do it all um, with a symbiotic relationship? You know, rewilding, yes, but it shouldn't be at the expense of. And ultimately, if you've got profitable farming businesses, those profitable businesses can afford to invest in nature. If they are not profitable, they will have a be absolutely focusing on what they're producing. Vicky, you've done a lot yes. on this in your career uh, <laughs> around the need to shift diets mm. and particularly about what that means for the uplands and the need to reduce mm. meat diet and eat less but better meat. Uh, what's your reaction to the questions and, of course, what Minette's just been saying? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a huge amount in it. And as, as you know, one of the first reports that I produced in relation to livestock and the environment had a, had a chicken on the front. Um, you know, let's not forget that a large proportion of the meat we eat is from intensive chicken and pig units. And whilst they are making efforts and they do have higher welfare standards, you know, I see in the future an, an ideal where we're eating much less um, from those systems and they're much less intensive, ideally that they're free range systems. Because what they do at the moment is they draw in a huge amount of land to feed them very intensively. And that includes land in previously forested, deforested areas in, in um, South America and in, in Indonesia. Even we're using palm kernel from Indonesia. So there's a huge cost of producing very cheap pig and poultry. So that's one side of it, which I think really has to change. On the other side of it, the um, ruminants, there is a large amount of fertilizer used on improved grassland for dairy systems. So we can't say it's all great for nutrients. I think that the uh, solution is to have less and better. And I think, you know, I think Minette's right that ultimately we do have to change. We have to do that change sensitively and well. And there is a whole heap of things in between no livestock in the uplands and um, what we have now. And I think farmers should be able to choose and, and think about what they can do to deliver public goods in the uplands. And it could be afforestation and shrubland with livestock, you know, but that needs to be paid for both through the market and through, through taxpayers. There is a vision that, that could really work there. Some rewilding, but some foresting and uh, just less and better and make sure those products are actually valued for what they are, which is a very nutritious, um, uh, costly product to produce. So they should, should be paid for properly. And one of the ways to drive that will be through the um, public procurement marketplace where government is purchasing really good meat um, less less meat, but good menus, um, using it in schools, hospitals, in the armed forces, etc. So driving that change where they can through their own purchasing. Okay, if I could just come in for a, for a second. So, I mean, the most famous rewilding project probably in, in England at the moment is Knapcastle. Um, and obviously they have introduced livestock into that system um, as a fundamental driver in habitats and creating the biodiversity that the site is so famous for. And the Wildlife Trust has clearly used livestock around the country to manage traditional hay meadows, heathland habitats, wood pasture, all of these different elements. So livestock are critical for biodiversity in certain habitats. They are really, really important. But I think, um, I think Vicky's hit the, the nail on the head. It, it is about numbers versus inputs. And the Wildlife Trust has commissioned research on that in the uplands to show that it, we should be using what nature gives us for free and using that as our driver, rather than putting those big inputs in, because you both have that herbicide use, um, sorry, you have that uh, fertilizer use, but you also have the, the large stocking numbers on the uplands, which is unsustainable uh, from, a, from a biodiversity point of view. So it's a complex issue, but actually we've got some really good information on our website about that if people want to read further. Janet, Steve, anything to add that you want to chip in here before I take us to a different, different angle? Will. Yeah, I will just chip in briefly, if I may. And I think I think I agree with an awful lot of what's been said, actually. I wanted to just chip in to make clear that certainly we see a future for farming in the uplands and we want to make sure that that's possible and and thriving through the through all of the work that we're doing. I think that the, I was going to mention a couple of points of just interest, really. One is the Nethergill report, which I read um, just just a few days ago, actually, having been referred to it. And it's so interesting about uh, farming in the uplands and how how it is possible to do that if you have an optimum level of production um, so that you can increase your margin. And, and there was some interest, there's some interesting research there about 
what what the what a possible future might look like for some farms up there and i've certainly visited some myself who are who are practicing along those sorts of lines of regenerative type practices where they're both farming for food and also for nature at the same time and they're able to increase their margins and reduce their stress by doing that and neil heseltine is a great example of this a sheep farmer who has who has um, actually reduced the size of his stock and he makes more money off it because of the way that he now farms it allowing natural processes to work through and he's really interesting on this topic so i would i the reason i mention these things is just to encourage others to seek them out because i think they're really interesting avenues to pursue and and in our in, and but what, what, what manette says is right that there needs to be space for, for a range of different approaches we certainly see a future for farming on the uplands there's a range of different approaches that people will take depending on their particular circumstances their particular preferences their particular farm type um, and we want to make space for all of that and support it broadly through the schemes that we're introducing okay good uh steve anything do you, do you want to add or you no i just the only thing i would add is that um i think it, it, it's very as an arable farmer it's very um it's very easy for the public to see perceive that there's livestock farmers and arable farmers and actually we all need each other and the the matrix that exists between the poultry industry the upland industry mm and and the areas between where you have the mixing is absolutely is essential for everything that we do and i think it goes back to what minette said earlier if you lose one part of the, of that of that chain then the rest falls down um uh, and you know i think this concentration on meat uh, and and the arable sector and upland and lowland farms those guys need us and we need them uh, and and it's a, it's a team effort and if we can't we can't not take our eyes off the fact that you know that's how it works great steve thank you well we've got we've just got less than 10 minutes left in the last 10 minutes i want to tackle another issue that we've had a load of comments and questions on in fact look more far more comments really than questions and it won't surprise you it is around pesticides and uh, of course the the we know that of those wildlife declines that we've observed since the early 1970s 41 percent of our wildlife species declined in abundance since the early 1970s and 54% uh, of farmland birds uh, declined in abundance uh, during that period as well. And you can, can I think, re realistically point the finger of blame at a lot of that at pesticides and the use of chemicals on land. Um, some people saying here, what about organic agriculture? How will the new uh, transition plan, how will the new scheme support organic? Mm. Uh, should we not be trying to shift to more organic agriculture? And Janet, I will come to you first actually around this, that um, of course in the transition plan, it's it, integrated pest management is talked about right from the outset, including in the, the base tier in, in the sustainable uh, farm uh, initiative. And uh, so can you just tell us how this transition plan will support moves to integrated pest management and perhaps say briefly what integrated pest management is and, um, and, and, and also answer that question, how, if at all, will it support organic agriculture? And then to the rest of the panel, what do we need to do about pesticides? You know, there, there is a challenge there. Uh, uh, what, what, what should be the future with pesticides over the decade ahead? Janet. It's a really big set of questions. So first of all, on organic, we have said in the plan that we want to make sure that our schemes work for and recognise organic farming and also other, sort of other practices that people are doing that we know contribute towards the sorts of outcomes that we're talking about. So we've made that commitment in there. We're working with the organic groups. We want to make, we want, and we will continue to do that to make sure that there's a place in these schemes for those, for those farmers who are practicing in that way. In terms of pesticides, so when we, when we launch the sustainable farming incentive, what we've said we'll do initially, th this is the 2022 version of it, where we'll have a, a few core elements of it, and then we'll, we'll build in more from there. We've said we'll start with some of the foundational elements of sustainable farming, really, which are to do with um, managing your soil so that it's not degraded, managing your use of fertilizers and managing pests. And we've talked about integrated pest management. I am not gonna to claim to be an expert about this, but what we're talking about there is using natural processes, reducing your reliance on pesticides, but doing that in a kind of whole farm integrated way, not just kind of turning a switch over here and hoping everything will be fine. Um, and, and we want to support those practices through the sustainable farming incentive to help people to shift their practices towards more sustainable ways of operating because we think they will contribute to both wildlife 
goals and, and nature goals, but also to climate reduction goals in the, in the case of looking after soil and also reducing inputs and also sustainability goals in the business sense of the word, because if you can, if you can reduce your inputs, that reduces your costs. So we think those are those that we, we think that they will be of wide appeal, those measures, and also that if we can achieve them at scale, if we can achieve adoption of them at scale, then that will make a big impact overall on the goals that we're trying to achieve. I do also always say when I talk about this, that's not the only element of environmental land management. There are lots of other things too that need to happen through the other components, but that will be the starting position for SFI, for sustainable farming incentive, I should say. Steve, what's your approach to this? I mean, as a nature-friendly farmer, what's your approach um, to, to dealing with so this? So I, I actually would um, welcome anybody to come around to our farm and uh, compare it to an organic farm, because I believe we have as much um, wildlife, if not more, um, on our farm. Um, we don't use pesticides extensively, but we do use pesticides. We are moving towards conservation tillage. We have now have far more um, uh, biodiversity in our soils. And, and I, I think there's a big, there's a very, um, for the consumer, there's a very black and white picture of organic and the big industrial uh, arable farm. And I actually think um, that that's quite overly represented and for agriculture as it is today, it's by far better than it was 20 years ago. Um, organic is far from actually clean, but uh, you know, I, th I believe that what we do here um, provides as much biodiversity as, it, as you would find on an organic farm. And, and actually at the bottom of this, um, you know, we do have to provide food for people to eat. And, and there is a balance to be met between, um, now I'm not saying organic wrong, of course I'm not, um, it has its place, but there is a balance where we have to produce food um, to feed a growing nation. So James, our position at the Wildlife Trust on this around pesticides and, and farming, what, I mean, what's the advice you give to farmers around pesticides? Know how easy it is to, when you have a problem, whether it's an insect or whether it's a plant, to reach straight away for those chemical solutions. And our advice is don't make that your first action. Consider the other alternatives, which some of which Janet was referencing. There is an increasing and, and wealth of information out there about natural solutions. They won't work in every single situation. And we're not saying never use them, but we are saying don't do the instinctive thing of just reach for them. And unfortunately, a lot of advice, to come back to some of the points Vicky made early on, is out there, which is reach for that chemical in the first instance. Um, don't do that straight away. Look at the natural solutions in the first place and then see if they're suitable for your farming system. Vicky, you've been campaigning for a pesticide reduction target in the bill. Didn't win one, unfortunately. Uh, what, what, what would that target be if you could, could wave a magic wand to make it happen? And, and what's your view on the perspectives we've been talking about here? Yes, I don't know what our target would be because I, I think... Um others are best place to, to say that if, and it, whether it would be appropriate to do one single target but I think we definitely need to you know, as we go forward for the nature emergency as you described and all the, the data shows we need to make changes and I think it's absolutely right that we start to talk to farmers now and it's great that the SFI has that element to it um, to see if they can start to make decisions differently and start to do things like forecasting, um, you know, predicting whether aphids are going to come in if they are, thinking about what they can do, um, monitoring levels of pests and, and weeds better. And I think that all relies on a really good foundation of research, farmer-led research, farmer-led demonstration and, and advice, um, a really independent, absolutely agree, independent ad advisory um, network needs to be rolled out really fast. Because if Janet is going to help farmers to um, have integrated pest management, they, they need to have that advice. And it could, it could be the farmer next door, or it could be on the phone, or it could be online. You know, but it, that, that advice is essential. But it, we know that it's got to be on a whole farm basis. So you've got to think of all the whole farm system and how that can contribute to pesticide reduction and nutrient um, and fertility issues and nature. You know, the, the whole picture together it's not not just one thing but there is whole hope whole load of um very good experience in the organic and non-organic sector to, to draw on here and i think it's very telling that europe has some of the european countries have 30 percent organic and they're benefiting from a whole 
reduction in pesticides in, in that land. And we should be doing that here in, in terms of a transition with a lot more organic, ideally we'd have 10% organic here. It's really sad that it's, it's not a large proportion of our land yet. And I hope that changes, but also all the other farming to starts to introduce really strong integrated pest management with pesticide use as the last resort. Annette, do you see the potential for reducing chemical inputs? And we're not talking about down to zero here, but, but do you see potential to reduce chemical inputs in the years ahead on farms? I know it's a very big question. I, I think we, we have to remember that, that um, inputs are expensive. Pesticides are expensive. You know, no farmer wants to waste pesticides because they don't want to damage nature. They don't want to damage wildlife. And it's a huge cost to the business. And the just to jump back to organic farming you know the fundamental rule of law with organic farming is for it to be market driven there is nothing worse for an organic farmer than other people choosing to be overly incentivized to produce an organic food that there isn't the market demand for it because all that does is crash your price so you want organic food to stay at a premium price and that has got to be market driven and that's what i said at the beginning you know consumers make those choices that ultimately drives the decisions that farmers make as of what food they should produce. Um, and the point that Steve makes is, is just fundamental to all of this. I mean, most of the organic farmers I know, it's not about organic or conventional. It's about a business choice that they've made that suits their business best. And, and certainly you can't say that organic achieves more for biodiversity or the environment than what Steve is doing. The point is you've got to invest in the environment. You've got to invest in biodiversity. It's not just a, it's not just a given. It doesn't just happen. You know, pollinator strips need as much care and attention as a crop, if not more care and attention. And, you know, precision farming, new R&D, new innovations, you know, these are the game changers in pesticide use. And, and dare I say, it, you know, plant breeding technologies in a world that is suffering with climate change, with drought, with extreme weather events. You know, if we can look at new plant breeding technologies that ultimately mean we don't need to use any pesticides at all, that we can massively lower our usage of chemical fertilizers. That's a win win for everybody, Craig. So it's about looking at every tool in the box in order to make sure effectively that we are producing the same yield or even a greater yield but we are constantly decreasing our food production footprint, decreasing wherever we can our inputs, because that's the game changer in all of this for both the farming business, for climate change and the environment. Thank you. Well, we've pretty much run out of time now. I'm going to come to each of you just for, asked for a one sort of sentence to close this. And here's my big question. I'm going to give you five seconds to think about it. So uh, if we're heading to head in the right direction over the next seven years of this transition to head in the next decade, uh, next, next direction over the next decade, what do you think has to be the top priority of what has to happen from government in the next year to make sure to give you the confidence we're heading in the right direction? We've heard the nice warm words this week in the transition plan. Uh, we've all kind of everyone said in different ways we need more detail. Uh, but what would you really like to see happen in the next year to give you confidence we're heading in the right direction. Vicky. Oh, God. I was thinking um, a vision, but then you said not a nice cosy vision, but I, I don't think we have that vision yet because we're also waiting for the national food strategy, which is coming out in the new year, which should be the way in which we link agriculture act, the environment bill, all the new policies together to say what we want our farming systems and our land use to look like. So if that comes out of the next year as a result of the National Food Strategy and we have some really good targets in the Environment Bill linked to the money and the, all the, the uh, resources in the Agriculture Bill, that should be a, a vision by the middle of next year, which sets farmers off in the right direction. Steve, what would you like to see in the next year to give you confidence for heading in the right direction? Um, I'd like to see a positive message come from DEFRA that actually um, puts some emphasis on... Um, a um, uh, biodiversity and that, but also um, gives us some reassurance um, as farmers that uh, food security, national food security is actually important to us and that whatever is going to, um, particularly with the Brexit trade deals, um, that, are looking, um, that anything that comes into this country is of an equal or higher standard to what we're producing here. And that what we have, as, as British farmers have invested in in the last, for generations, um, and I think Manette 
use the expression heartbeat at the end of the lane um, isn't going to be thrown out with the bathwater. Right. Um, so, thanks, Steve. Manette, what would you really like to see in the next year to know that we're heading the right direction? Well, before Christmas, I want to see a really good EU-UK <laughs> trade deal. <laughs> so I'm going to give myself two bites of the cherry here. So for the rest of 2020, <laughs> that's my wish list. And then next year, it, it's still all about trade. It's all about food security. It's all about making sure, for me, that we have more British food on more British plates. We've had a great conversation tonight about retail. We haven't even touched on procurement or out-of-home eating. Um, you know, if we could get British food predominantly in our hospitals, in our schools, uh, in our military, that's four billion pounds worth of market. The out of home sector, you know, what the chefs have, have shown in this last year and all the surveying, one poll research shows that now from 75 percent to 86 percent of people surveyed on the back of COVID said they wanted to see more British food here. Um, on our shelves. So look, we've got the chance. I think as farmers, we're up for the challenge of doing it differently, doing it sustainably, following the government policy, which Janet's done such a great job today, outlining uh, the thoughts for the future. But that would be my, my hope for next year, that we, um, we, we maintain and grow our commitment to British food. Thank you, Manette. And James, what's your big hope for the next year? I'm going to give you one really boring answer and then a slightly more interesting one, if that's all right. Um, and I can't believe this is my first answer, which is around WTO rules and making sure that actually DEFRA can pay what it costs to put biodiversity back into our landscape. And we don't go through all those pilots and then find out that WTO won't let us actually do it. So making sure that all of the systems join up so that we can actually genuinely put biodiversity back in and pay farmers and land managers what it costs to do that. So that's pretty critical. Um, but really, for me, it's about the Environment Act. You know, we've got the Agriculture Act now, but what does the Environment Act look like? Let's make that sing for this country so that we genuinely know where we're going for the environment and it works beautifully so we understand what we're going to put back in our landscape. Janet, it wouldn't be fair for me to ask you that question, <laughs> but maybe you can tell us what, what should we maybe expect for next? What do you think is the next milestone that, uh, that, that we might need to look to differ for? So for me and my team, um, I can't speak for the rest of DEFRA, but for me and my team, the priority next year is, are, is about delivery and about detail and fleshing that out. And in both cases, we really, really need everybody here and the wider community that's interested in this to get involved and help us get this right. And so I will be doing events like this all the time, trying to drum up interest and participation and collaboration and answering people's questions and trying to build a head of steam around this so that we can really get it right. Because we do, as Manette said at the beginning, we have a once in a lifetime, not even just once in a generation chance to do something really incredible here together, but only if we all get involved and we all put our shoulder to the grindstone and make this happen. And um, so obviously I will be working tirelessly along with my team to make it happen because that's our job, but we do need the wider sector to come, to come with us. And so I, d details and delivery in 2021. So if I come back this time next year, you can, you can tell me whether you think we've achieved that or not. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for what I've, I hope you've agreed is a really good conversation tonight. We've covered a huge range of topics. Uh, of course, there's many we haven't covered that we would love to have covered in the time. And we've had hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of uh, comments coming in tonight and questions coming in. We haven't been able to deal with all of them. But I will say to all of you, the panellists as well, that you can always look back on YouTube and look at those comments uh, and take time to, to read them as they come in. But a big thank you for me, uh, first of all, to all of the panel, of course, to Minette Patters, to Steve Honeywood, to Vicky Hurd, to James Adler and to Janet Hughes. Thank you so much for taking time out tonight to be part of this conversation. It's been really important and we've got through a lot of topics there. Really important conversation about where next for British farming and for nature. Very important. Thank you to all of you watching and all the comments that you've given tonight. And a reminder, of course, that you can catch up on all the previous wild lives that we've had on planning, on the marine environment, on a whole range of issues out there. You can, you can stream the box set uh, over Christmas if you really, really want to. If you really get stuck in lockdown and you've never got around to it, you can stream the box set of Wildlife. They're all on YouTube to watch. And we've had 
well over we had nine and a half thousand views so far of the last one we did on these and i'm sure this will go high as well they've been a huge success and thank you for all the feedback you give us in between them on that we will be back in 2021 uh, with the next wildlife and we'll be running them right through 2021 on a whole range of topics if there's a particular wildlife issue you want us to address then let us know at the wildlife trust we'd be delighted to put it in the mix and consider it uh, and uh, we'd love to hear from you so please do that in the meantime thanks again to the panel and thank you to all of you have a great winter break good seasonal break and we'll see you again in early 2021 thank you and good night Thank you.